Okay, next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Glenn Morgan. He's a professor of management at Bristol a University in the UK. So, uh, you, also the, you can check out uh, the show by on the 469. Uh, uh, so today, uh, so he's going to uh, present uh, uh, with the title, is Exploring 21st Century in Capitalism Asia. Please uh, welcome him with a big hand. <laughs> uh, Professor Morgan. Uh, I want to say, first of all, uh, that I still take some responsibility for capitalism and capitalisms uh, as the title of this conference and, and uh, the, this relates to a book that uh, I edited a few years ago with a colleague Richard Whitley uh, and what we wanted to do in that book was to, uh, two things uh, firstly to spread the uh, the, the, the examples that were being used to discuss forms of capitalism, to spread those away from uh, the usual suspects in, in Europe and the US and, and Asia. Uh, but secondly, what we wanted to do was to say that it's not all about just understanding institutional change in particular countries and how particular countries are evolving towards new forms of capitalism, but to understand that capitalism itself is also evolving in new directions. And uh, therefore, we need to have some sort of sense as to what, what this broader creature called capitalism is. And uh, that respect, we need to think both what capitalism was uh, in the post-war Keynesian Fordist period and how it has, has started to evolve into a, a new form of, of capitalism. And uh, there were two broad trends, I think, that, uh, that we started to identify there. Uh, both of them were about the degree of interdependence between different forms of capitalism, different forms of national capitalism, that was emerging in the uh, current period. And so one of those forms of dependence was the way in which firms were becoming increasingly organized through global value chains across taking advantage of different institutional locations in order to uh, both increase efficiency but in order to also learn and develop new sets of, new sets of products. And that, in a sense, was related to the broader sort of theme of uh, the opening up of, of markets and uh, the facilitation of flows across borders. The second aspect of this was uh, the one that I will concentrate on today, which uh, is the growing importance of finance in the system <coughs> of, it, it, within this sort of new form of capitalism that is emerging. And so this concept, uh, frequently referred to as financialization, uh, is, I think, uh, an important uh, concept for us to consider how capitalism as a, uh, as a sort of system is emerging and developing. And so the, the, there are, my paper consists of, therefore, three parts. I want to, first of all, discuss the concept of financialization in, in, in Western forms of capitalism. And then I want to ask uh, two questions about Asia uh, and Asian forms of capitalism. My first question is, is the development or was the development of financialization in Western capitalism independent of what was going on in Asia or was it connected to it? Uh, I think there's an assumption that, fin a lot of people, the assumption that when we talk about financialization, we're essentially talking about Wall Street, what happens in the US, et cetera, and it's a sort of US disease. And therefore, as far as uh, Asia is concerned, uh, it, it is innocent of contributing to financialization. 
And I want to look at that again and argue that, no, in fact, uh, the phase of financialization that we see has been very much about the interdependencies and the interactions between Asia and uh, Western capitalisms. And then the, the second question is, are, and I'm concentrating here on the East Asian economies, are they themselves becoming more financialized? So very much a, uh, an initial attempt to, to look at this idea of financialization in Asian economies. Let me start by saying that I don't, uh, I don't subscribe to a sort of uh, David Harvey type view of a, of a new class project. I think the term was mentioned yesterday. Uh, in terms of, of a, a sort of conspiracy theory that uh, there's, there's a sort of change that has been engineered by uh, a, a relatively small group uh, of individuals, change engineered towards neoliberalism, towards financialization, etc. What I think we're talking about is more uh, a slow incremental uh, and contingent political process of uh, establishing new sets of practices, new ways of doing things, uh, in which finance has become the dominant uh, organisational form of the economy. So, for a brief definition of financialization, then, uh, for me, it involves a... Uh, a new accumulation regime in which finance and financial markets dominate the organization of the economy and shape the state and society. Now, uh, let me say, and I'll say it again halfway through, that if you see this as contingent, if you see this as a matter of actors taking political opportunities, uh, some actors gaining in power, etc. You don't see this as, as a regime that is born and has all its components there together at the same time, but rather as uh, a regime that uh, develops in different sort of parts of the state, the society and the economy and under certain circumstances becomes reinforcing and becomes... Uh, dominant and uh, becomes resistant even to crises such as 2008. So even though we've had the great financial global crisis, uh, we've seen finance re-establish itself. So uh, I want to emphasize that idea of, of uh, financialization as contingent uh, emergent uh, because Clearly, also related to this, is the idea that uh, societies, national forms of capitalism, vary in the degree to which they, uh, they, their institutions develop or start to uh, become financialized. If, if our only uh, uh, signal was whether a society was entirely financialized or not, wouldn't be much interest, I think. But what is of interest is the, the degree to which uh, society ca capitalisms are financialized and where that is happening and, and why that is happening. So I will summarize uh, briefly the, uh, the idea of financialization as something that exists on four main levels. And again, uh, this reinforces the uh, idea that that we can look at each of these levels to see to what degree financialization has emerged there or not. So the levels that I want to emphasize are firstly financialization as a, a regime of accumulation where profits increasingly come from the financial activities both of banking uh, institutions, but also of uh, uh, manufacturing firms themselves. So that uh, how, you, how you manage your finances and what uh, sort of role you play in financial markets uh, becomes increasingly uh, important to 
the uh, success of the, of the firm. Now, the growth, the growth of the financial sector, the growth of uh, financial activities uh, has, we can see that in the US and the UK in particular, uh, these societies have become dominated uh, by the, uh, the financialization as a, a regime of accumulation. This depends upon, obviously, on, on deregulated financial markets. Uh, it depends upon uh, a growth of, of what perhaps called privatized Keynesianism. In other words, the uh, growth of credit facilities for, uh, for individuals and firms to enable them to uh, engage in, in financial markets. And it, it becomes, uh, in this way, the, the financial sector becomes a very dominant and important influence on politics. So the way in which uh, this sector impacts on politics uh, is, a, is a crucial part of this because the demands that the sector has about how uh, society should be organized start to p penetrate into uh, both how uh, the state itself is organized and into how uh, individuals manage their lives within this broad context. The second aspect is, is one that we talked a bit about yesterday, which is the idea of the shareholder-driven firm as a guiding principle. So here, the control that is exercised by the financial markets on corporations to adopt business practices that promote shareholder value leads to this short-term uh, focus on short-term value and uh, this is this impact on the the nature of employment relations inside the firm and uh, the restructuring of uh, existing and, and new jobs inside the firm I won't spend much time on that because I think that that's pretty well known. The third one though is uh, that the state also uh, be is part of this sort of regime of uh, new, is, is reshaped under this new regime. The financial sector pressurizes the state to reduce uh, tax on corporate and personal wealth and uh, on income. It also, the financial sector has also been um, very effective in developing means of tax avoidance, in developing tax havens, offshore financial centres, and in inhibiting the uh, ability uh, or inhibiting the states, so states from carrying uh, on their investigations into uh, offshore centres and tax havens. Now, over the last few years, this has become uh, more controversial, the, the nature of taxes uh, and uh, of tax havens. But I want to come back to that because I think it is an interesting aspect of how financialization is reaching into East Asia. We'll come back to that later, as I said. But So the central pressure here is on uh, the state to reduce corporate and personal wealth. Now, the, what that means is that the overall tax take, so to speak, uh, starts to shrink. It becomes more focused on consumption uh, taxes and uh, the ability to pay for the welfare state that was characteristic uh, of the period uh, before the ninth, from around the 1980s, that becomes less and less. And when you get the uh, financial crisis as well, where states have to uh, save their banking systems and use their revenues for also for dealing with increased unemployment, etc., the result is that states have states increasingly move to becoming borrowing states to to uh, depend on financial markets and their intermediaries for sovereign debt to enable them to resolve these these crises. And uh, Wolfgang Strait talks about the rise of the, the debt state, the debtor state, the idea that uh, the state itself has become uh, more and more financialized. It's dependent on 
the, uh, the financial markets, the interest rates in the financial markets. And of course, this is where the Eurozone uh, crisis emerges from the uh, growing differentiation in interest rates um, to Greece and the other countries uh, of the southern Mediterranean areas. So financialization of the state. So we've got the financialization uh, in terms of uh, the sources of accumulation, the growth of finance itself, financialization in terms of what happens to companies, financialization in terms of what happens to the state, and then finally financialization of the everyday, uh, the, emphasis, the emergence of financially disciplined subjects, the investing subject. So, so uh, in the uh, so Keynesian Fordist welfare state period, the state itself took a role in ensuring uh, pensions, health, home ownership, etc. But now, as the state has, under the impact of financialization, withdrawn from that, these areas are uh, the responsibility of the individual, increasingly the responsibility of the individual. So uh, this is an area where finance can expand again, role of credit cards, loans to fund current consumption, the uh, rise of mortgage payments, the rise of private health protection, rise of pensions, the growth of day trader culture. All of these things then are grist to the mill of the financial sector. They are uh, new product areas that it colonizes, that it uh, creates, and uh, where it, in effect, starts to substitute for some of the things that were given by the state or by the accumulation regime under, under Keynesianism. So uh, the stagnation of wages in the US and uh, in, in the UK, which could have led to uh, declining consumption, is substituted by increased borrowing and in increased debt. And so individuals become subject to this as well. So those are the four uh, levels which, in a, I would say, constitute a sort of institutional ensemble, uh, an assemblage of elements that uh, emerge to make, uh, to make uh, financialization uh, as it's to define the terrain of financialization. Now, financialization and forms of Western capitalism, as I said at the start, there's variability. There's variability depending on institutional legacies. So penetration of shareholder values, discussed yesterday, is slowed by different forms of share ownership, degree of personal financialization affected by national context for pensions, health, etc. Degree of dependence on borrowing from financial markets affected by strength of the economy. The degree of the financial sector affected by the power of state and manufacturing sector. So uh, we don't see financialization always the same, the same form of it in different forms of Western capitalism. But let me move on to get to my main points, which is, firstly, has Western financialization been connected to or independent of developments in Asian capitalism? Well, my argument is that it's, it's been very much connected to developments in Asian forms of capitalism. For a start, the, the whole pressure on uh, uh, competitiveness pressure <laughs> placed upon uh, Western companies by the rise of the uh, East Asian Tigers initially, but more later, uh, later and with more, more impact, uh, the rise of China, of course, has fundamentally changed what were the possibilities in uh, the US and, and Europe for uh, combining a uh, strategy for uh, labor as well as uh, for capital. So those effects, in fact, were part and were added to by particular political developments, were part of weakening labor 
and therefore enabling the, the strengthening of uh, the financial sector in terms of its influence over the state. But a more, uh, more substantial one, which has been mentioned a few times, I think, is uh, China's external reserves and the impact which they have had uh, on the, uh, US Treasury bonds, low interest rates, and the search for yield. The, the notion that, um, of, of the wall of money that was described going back into the early 2000s, of the wall of money heading out of China, heading towards uh, Wall Street and uh, towards uh, the city of London, and what, what could be done with that. And so this wall of money, uh, which went into safe investments, nevertheless it had its impact in terms of uh, generating what's called search for yield. And uh, so it derives from China's trade surplus. Uh, so this, this leads, as many people have talked about, to this sort of tangled web of relationships between China uh, and the US. Uh, China is effectively invested in the dollar and uh, it's, it's struggling at the moment to, uh, to decide about uh, and to decide how it can uh, move away from the dollar. Again, as discussed yesterday, uh, to be dependent upon the dollar, to be dependent on uh, the value of the dollar and to be dependent on the US not devaluing to a significant degree uh, means that China, although it's a world power, is crucially dependent on, uh, on the US. So China has responded by minor adjustments to the UN, but basically uh, the, the question is if China liquidates its a proportion of its holdings, uh, how would that impact on the US and uh, the uh, European economies and, and uh, the UK as well? And why should, why should China do this? Well, we've discussed that, that, that it needs, there needs to be some uh, restructuring. And so, summarizing quickly, I think that we have to see this, and this goes back to my point about capitalism as a system, we have to see this as relationships between different capitalisms at this point in time, and that financialization in the West has been dependent upon China in particular maintaining its role. And if it ceases to do that, then there could be crises. So that's my first point, that we have to see these connections and not just treat these societies as though they're, they're, they're independent or autonomous. Is, moving on to the second question, is financialization growing in East Asian economies? Are firms, taking the first thing, are firms becoming more shareholder driven? Well, I think we had a good discussion yesterday with Marcus Polman's paper and others, uh, that, that this is not the case uh, in, the, in China, Korea and Japan. The continued role of business groups, families, state ownership mitigates against this. Uh, the evidence on the use of stock options is, is limited. So I, I don't think that, in terms of my institutional ensemble, I don't think firms are becoming more shareholder driven. So this sort of knocks one pillar away from uh, the, the idea that uh, financialization is impacting. Does the financial sector dominate the economy as a whole? Now, I think, I think we have to distinguish here between uh, Japan and Korea and, and China. In relation to Japan and Korea, following crises in the 1990s and 2000s, the banking sector, I think, has, uh, has, was contained, did not suffer severe contagion from the 2008 financial crisis, uh, and, it's, and these sectors are uh, important, but relatively weak. They're not powerful in their own rights, uh, financial institutions in Japan and Korea. But I think there's a, a very different sort of story that is uh, emerging in China, which we've heard a little bit about with regard to the uh, growth of the sovereign wealth funds uh, in China, the uh, growth and here I come back to the point about offshore tax havens, 75% uh, of uh, outward foreign direct investment in China goes through uh, three 
three uh, offshore tax centers. Firstly, Hong Kong, and then from there, uh, if pe people uh, realize this, the British Virgin Islands uh, in the Caribbean and the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean, which are notable tax havens. Uh, now, by putting OF, by putting outward foreign direct investment and the same thing with inward foreign direct investment through these tax havens. Uh, these are tax havens that are basically uh, operated and uh, managed by Western financial institutions, by Western law, law firms, Western accountancy firms. So again, what is happening here is that uh, for various reasons to do with uh, how China is seeking to control its currency and seeking to limit the uh, degree of connection between, the in, between what happens inside China in terms of finance and what happens outside China, uh, the, what it's doing effectively is also bolstering up, uh, again, the institutions and, and firms that constitute the core of financialization in, in the Western context. So I, I think that the fate of the financial sector in China and this relationship between inside and outside, again, is becoming increasingly tied to uh, financialization processes in the West. Thirdly, about the debtor state in Asia, well, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, not happening, the, the processes that I described, not happening to the same extent in Asia. Japanese state is highly indebted, but that's mainly to its own citizens. 226% uh, of GDP, the, the debt in, uh, in Japan, which uh, you know, is uh, very high. Korea, on the other hand, has only 33% uh, of its debt to, to GDP, whereas the US has 90% and the UK 75%. So the Korean state has low level of debt. It's, it, it is sort of keeping itself out of these processes of, of financialization. But China, again, is a more complex model, controlled internally. Um, but there, as previous speaker mentioned, of course, the, there is fear of a collapse of the uh, Chinese financial system because of the degree of bad loans that uh, were lent in the uh, immediate aftermath of the uh, financial crisis to local authorities. So, uh, so also, of course, recently we saw the, uh, the, the crash of the Chinese stock markets uh, as a reflecting a high degree of speculation that has gone on in the Chinese uh, context. So I think we, we need to examine more about uh, China in, in relation to this process of how its state is becoming financialized. And then finally, and I think this is an interesting one that we uh, could do with more understanding about, is that in uh, China, Japan, and Korea, we have fast rising personal debt. So China's household debt uh, grew by 332% in 2013. That was the highest rate of growth in the world. Uh, in, uh, Korea has, has household debt as percentage of GDP. Korea's is 92.9%, which is the 10th highest in the world. Again, indicating a, a dependence uh, an increased dependence on financial institutions. Uh, in terms of total household debt, Japan and China uh, are second and third in the world in terms of, of total. But this, uh, this exists alongside in China, one of the highest savings rates in the world, 50%. Uh, Korea's savings rate, 34%. And Japan's, which used to be very high, is uh, still above the UK and the US at 18%. So I think this question of how uh, financialization is impacting inside uh, these societies in terms of what is happening to uh, individuals, how they are sustaining 
debt and savings and why they, why they are su sustaining them in this particular way is an important question. I think this reflects rising aspirations, growing activity of financial institutions, but also the relationship between the state and welfare that is distinctive in the East Asian context. That's my iPad saying that I've done. So, <laughs> uh, just a final slide. So I think financialization in the West is interconnected with developments in China and is dependent on that. Financialization as a phenomenon faces some institutional barriers in East Asia, particularly at the level of the firm, but it has some possibilities to grow from below from changing consumer credit markets and from above uh, from state borrowing and finance. Thank you. Thank you.